All right. Thanks everyone for being here. I am Mike Saunders, a principal consultant here at Red Siege. Today I'm going to talk to you about Buffer Overflow 101. Um, here's some stuff about Red Siege. We do things. It's fun. Here's some stuff about me, principal consultant with Red Siege. Been around in IT for a while. Been in security since 2007. I like to do stuff. I'm getting kind of old and crotchety, so get off my lawn. Um, well, that's about enough about me. Why are we talking about Buffer Overflow 101? Well, when I first started thinking about Buffer Overflows and trying to, to learn about them, this is what I really thought about Buffer Overflows, right? Like, it was magic.gif. Like, I knew that you took some data and you stuffed it in this thing called a buffer, and if you put too much in, things happen. And that's about what I understood. I didn't know any more than that. And uh, I wanted to know more about how it worked, uh, but was really intimidated by it and didn't know how to get started. And so when I started going through, uh, when I did my OSCP is when I really started to learn this stuff, started digging into the resources they had, started doing a lot more searching and just getting over that fear of like, oh, buffer overflows are just make my brain hurt and I don't know where to go. So I started researching, working through it, and the more I did, it became demystified. And uh, I am by no means an expert at this, uh, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the stuff that I learned that'll help you understand a basic buffer overflow. Uh, but to do that, I do need to give you some assumptions, well, you know, lay out some assumptions for buffer overflows here. We're dealing with 32-bit x86 architecture. This isn't 64-bit. Um, we're dealing with stack-based buffer overflows, the kind where we overwrite the return address, and that's it. There's no SCH here. There's no uh, egg hunters. We're not doing more advanced things. Um, there are no stack canaries. There's no depth. There's no SLR, ASLR protections. We're not doing ROP chains here. This is the very basic 101 level buffer overflow. Excuse me. So with those assumptions in mind, what we might need to do for some of you is to define what is a buffer overflow. So we've got a buffer overflow. What is it? That's great. If this is not a buffer overflow, um, Sub T's tweet was was gold, and I was glad I saved this before it got deleted. But uh, this is not a buffer buffalo overflow. Um, a buffer overflow is when a program incorrectly allows writing more data into a space in memory called a buffer than it had previously allocated. And when we write more data into that buffer, then we overwrite adjacent memory locations. That's what a buffer overflow is at the most basic. Let's say you set up a buffer in memory and you allocate 100 bytes. If you then write in 200 bytes of data, you filled up your first 100 bytes that you allocated for your buffer, the next 100 bytes overwrote an adjacent memory location. That is buffer overflow at its most basic. We're gonna talk about how to do that and how to actually weaponize that. So to do that, we need to talk about a few things. One of the things we need to talk about is the stack. The stack is this memory structure within your computer. Um, you can think of it as a place that stores data in contiguous blocks, and it's a temporary storage location that's in the RAM in your computer. We typically use the stack to do things like storing local data um, about an application, parameter values, um, so variables, uh, and return addresses, which will become very important here in a little bit. The stack is a last in, first out data structure. So if you think of like a, a stack of plates that you see when you're at a buffet, you keep loading plates in. If you want to get to the fifth plate down, you have to take the four plates that are on top of that off, right? So you, the last one that went on is one that's on the top of the stack. That's the first one to come out. That's how the stack operates. <clears throat> I find it's helpful to look at the stack from a visual perspective. So I've got some diagrams here that uh, I adapted from probably Wikipedia. And 
Yeah, indeed, Wikipedia. So this is a stack. So if you look in here, and I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, I'm trying to point it out for you here. Um, Jaycon, are you guys seeing my mouse when I'm moving it around here? Yes, all right. So we have our stack. This entire space here is the stack. And you see that we have numbers all zero at the bottom to all S at the top. So the memory addresses are growing this way, it grows down. If some of you took computer science, studied this stuff in school, you may have learned this inverted, and that's the way it's usually taught in schools with the higher memory addresses at the top. And obviously that makes a lot of sense, like it grows up in that, in when you're thinking about it that way. However, all the resources that I learned from taught it this way. Uh, as a result, this is the way I think of it. So lower memory addresses are at the top, and as we add more data on the stack, it grows this way. So let's say in our stack we have a program, just a simple program. This program has one function uh, that stores a variable called foo. So we've got foo here, we defined it in the stack. We have this thing called ESP or the stack pointer that points to what is the top of the stack, which is ironically the lowermost memory address in the stack for our program. It's called the top of the stack. We have some other stuff like frame pointers and there's other things in here that are very important and we're not gonna talk about any of them. And then we have a return address and then we have our parent routine stack. So if you think of a program that has a main function and then it has another function called bar and bar does one thing where it defines this variable foo this is kind of what that stack would look like this would be main here this would be bar up here where it defines character foo now if we were to add more data onto the stack let's say we added a variable called bar a 10 byte variable called bar we push that onto the stack that goes here now Right, so it grows here, and I need to remember, I, I said something, the stack grows downwards towards higher memory addresses, we push stuff on it, but it actually would get allocated up here at a lower memory address. Oh, we will get you your AIP ghost, we will get you your AIP. So we've got bar, we pushed it on here. If we were to pop bar off the stack, then we're back here. We push bar on, it looks like this. So. You need to think about this, study it some, look at it in a debugger, it will make more sense. I'm kind of breezing through this. Key things to remember, um, address moves lower, the ESP register moves lower as we push data onto the stack and as we take data off the stack or pop data off the stack, the address moves higher. Now there are other registers that are part of what's called the general purpose register set. We've got the accumulator and uh, the stack pointer, um, the base pointer. All of these are important. And again, we're not gonna talk about any of them. Uh, they historically had more defined uses. Uh, for instance, the accumulator was used specifically for one function more so than other ones. However, now compilers can kind of do what they need to to make things uh, make things work a little bit uh, faster and more optimized. So this is what they were historically. They're important, you should know about them. The only thing we're gonna know about here is the stack pointer. There are also things called special purpose registers. One of them is the extended instruction pointer. And it's extended, uh, if you're wondering, because we're in 32-bit architecture. If we were in 16-bit, then it would be, uh, there would be no E, it would just be IP, the instruction pointer. So we've got the extended instruction pointer. And the, Extended instruction pointer stores the address of the next instruction to be executed. It does not store the instruction to be executed. It stores the address of the next instruction to be executed, which is a very important distinction. It stores addresses, not instructions. If you can control what goes into EIP, you can control the flow of execution. However, this is, Easier said than done because you cannot modify EIP directly for the most part. Can only be modified through specific uh, 
specific instructions uh, indirectly through the kernel. You can't modify EIP. So when someone says, I overwrote EIP, they didn't overwrite EIP. They overwrote the return address, which got loaded into EIP, and we'll talk about that later. If any of you know Kami Bastard, tell him you overwrote EIP because he loves that. So let's look at a stack buffer overflow. We have a simple program here. We have a program. We've got a main function and main calls uh, one function here, foo, and it passes it argv1, which is an argument that we get it, that we pass to it on the command line. And then we see we define foo up here, right? It takes one variable. That variable, we're defining a character array of 12 bytes. We're going to use stir copy, and we're going to copy what we received on the command line into C. So we created this buffer here. We allocated a buffer. And we're going to copy what we received on the command line into our buffer. The reason this happens to be a buffer overflow is because we're not doing any bounce checking. Stir copy is not safe. Uh, yeah, ghost, it is bad, bad, bad. It's not doing any bounce checking. It just says, hey, you gave me 100 bytes, I'm going to write 100 bytes. It doesn't check to see if that buffer will hold 100 bytes, which is why we can use it for buffer overflows. We're going to print out the data that we stuffed into the buffer, and then there's an implied return here, which will return us back to main, and then main will execute with this return zero. There's a few things that we don't see here that are happening that I will explain a little bit, like with how the return address functions. If we were to look at our stack as the program's executing, we've got our parent routine stacked down here. This is main. And then we've got here, this entire section here, this is foo. This section here. Foo consists of C which is a 12-byte character array that we defined. There's something called a base pointer, and there's something called a return address. What is the return address? Well, when we have this code here, say, call foo with an argument that we passed from the command line, what happens is a return address, the memory address of the next, exec, next instruction to execute, which in this case happens to be return zero, oops, gets stored by the, uh, the compiler and the, and the computer work together to put in assembly code that stores the return address, the address of return zero on the stack. It pushes that on the stack, then it pushes some other stuff on the stack, then it, it uh, uh, pushes this buffer that we created. So if we were to run our program under normal conditions, remember we set a 12-byte character array, um, we give it hello. It prints out hello and it exits. Nothing bad happened. The reason that is, if we were to look at this, this is what the stack would look like. We would see that our buffer that we created contained hello, and then it creates or it has this, this null terminator in here, and that's because strings in C and C are null terminated. So we pushed in five bytes. It actually put in six because that null terminator, everything worked fine. We didn't overwrite our buffer, we pop that data off the stack when we printed it to the screen with the printf statement, and then the program popped these addresses off the stack. It popped the return off, return address off the stack, it got loaded into EIP, which took us back to main, and we executed. So what happens if we do this? We're going to do a buffer overflow. We're going to give it 16 bytes of A's, and then we're going to give it 4 bytes of hex CC's. We run our program with that. And you can see here, we run the program, it printed out 16 A's, four bytes of hex CC's, and then there was a segmentation fault. I'm gonna say that again, because that's a really important thing to understand. We ran our program, we gave it 16 bytes of A's and four bytes of hex CC's. So we gave it that input, it printed out that input, back to the screen. So it copied the data into the buffer and then printed it out to the screen and then a segmentation fault occurred. And that's the key thing to note there. This, the segmentation fault occurred after it printed out to the screen. 
So if we were to look at the stack, we put these 16 bytes of XCs, our A's in here. The location where our return address should be was overwritten with hex CCs. So now after it's printed out to the screen, the computer tries to load the return address into EIP. So it reads this address, pops it off the stack. And now EIP is going to be CC, 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 which is not a valid location in memory where our program lives. So the computer doesn't know what to do for the next instruction. It's like, hey, I went to this place. It doesn't exist. I have no instructions. It's segmentation faults. So that's the important thing to note. We overwrote the location where the return address is stored. And someone mentioned, should that not have the null byte? Yes, it should be. I'm just trying to make things uh, overly simplified here. Uh, we've got our hex CCs in here where the return address should be. And as a result, EIP was loaded with that return address, which doesn't point to a valid location in memory, segmentation fault occurs. How can we weaponize this? Well, I've got some demos. I'm not gonna do any live demos here, but I got some videos for you. <clears throat> so in this video, um, you're gonna look at a program. Actually, you know what, let me back up. Before I go through this, I do have links for this at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the slides. I'm going to be using a program called Vuln Server. Vuln Server is written by a guy named Stephen Bradshaw. And the purpose of Vuln Server is to help you understand buffer overflows. It's an intentionally vulnerable program. Uh, the way it works is similar to the way that uh, a web server works in that you connect to it on a port, you give it a verb. So just like a web server, you connect to it and you say get, and then you give it uh, something that you want to get, right? Like get space slash win space HTTP slash 1.1. Hit enter. And then uh, when you hit enter, it sends a carriage return line feed to the server, which tells the server, hey, I'm done sending input. You can process it. In a similar fashion, Vuln Server has a set of commands. One of them is the trun command. So if you want to give it the trun command, you say trun space period, and everything after the period becomes the, uh, becomes the input that we're going to work with in our program. So trun space period tells uh, Vuln Server, I have a command for you, you're gonna run trun, and here's the data that you're gonna process. So, that's how this program works. So I've got some Python code and the Python code is also linked for you at the end of the slide. So you can go to my GitHub, grab this stuff and run through this on your own machine. So let's press play here. So I've got a Python script that I've set up. It's really simple. We're gonna fuzz the input length, meaning the amount of data that we're feeding to the trun command. We set up a counter, we set up an empty buffer in, in our Python program here. And what we're going to do is we're gonna do a loop and we're gonna add a number of A's and add T run space period plus our A's into the buffer, then increase our counter so we add more A's the next time through and we keep looping through and then we send that data once we've built our buffer up with all of our strings, we send all our strings to the server. So we're gonna use a simple socket code to send it to the server. We're gonna see what happens. Now, I gotta remember which video. All right, so I have uh, the immunity debugger here working and you can see I'm loaded, I'm attached to bone server. The window you're looking at right now is the actual code for the application. These are those registers that we talked about. You can see EAX and ESP and EIP. EIP is pointing to a location in NTDLL right now. So that's where the next execution or the next instruction to execute happens. Um, what you're seeing me scroll through now is actually the stack. So this is data for the program. So very simple here. This is part of the Vuln server program loaded in memory. We're looking through the stack. So we're gonna run our Python script and we start sending those strings to the server. And we send our strings and it keeps coming back, trun complete, 
all the way up to 1900 bytes. But when we send 2100 bytes, we do not get a T run complete back. If we look in immunity, we see it's paused and we see access violation when executing 41, 41, 41, 41, 41. Those 41s are the ASCII representation of A's. So we see here EAX contains our full command. ESP, the stack pointer, is pointing to a location that starts or that is filled with a bunch of A's. And we see that EIP is 41, 41, 41, 41, which we know is a bunch of A's, right? So we know that we filled up the buffer, we ended up overwriting the location where the return address lives in the stack with A's. So at this point, we know it's possible to overwrite the return address, but we don't know more than that. We need to hone in on getting the exactly how much data do we need to overwrite that return address. So key points to remember, we broke somewhere between 1900 and 2100 bytes of input. We know that EIP was 41s, which were the A's that we put in. So the way we find out about uh, exactly how much memory we need before we can overwrite the return address, uh, various ways to do it. Um, I go through something in the slides that you download. There's a section on a, what's called a binary tree method that I'm not going to go through here just because of time. But the binary tree method uh, would also work, just takes longer. Pattern create is a Metasploit utility that will create a non repeating pattern of strings uh, or a string pattern of characters up to about 20,000 bytes. I think I'm not quite sure where it is. Um, but here I'm giving it the command pattern create l 2500. It'll create a pattern that's 2500 bytes in length that does not repeat. So this will become important here in a little bit. So I've got another Python script. I've run that command to generate my, my pattern. So instead of creating a loop like I did before, I'm just gonna have my buffer is t run space period. I am going to append that output from pattern create onto my buffer and I'm gonna send it to the server. We're gonna see what happens. <clears throat> so we're gonna send it to the server, and when we will see what EIP is. We see right now that our program is running. So we send it just like we expected um, Vuln server is going to crash because that's uh, what we were supposed to be doing. We see that EIP, we have an access violation when executing 396F4338. Um, just like before, we can see our full command in EAX. We can see ESP is pointed to some location as CP0C. We see that EIP is 396F4338. 396F4338. 3.8. Excuse me. Now, if we look down here in the stack, we see that the stack pointer is pointed to a location, the 00B7FA0C, which happens to be that value right there. All right, it's this one right here. So ESP is pointing to here. Now, if we look here, right above 396F43. 38 396F4338. So what we do when we write when we run this is we're now going to record the number that is in EIP, which happens to be 396F4338. 396F4338 um, is we know that the ESP, the point that ESP, excuse me, the address that ESP is pointing to starts with CP0C, that, that buffer location is CP0C. We know that this is 396F4338, which is 8C09. Now, I, I should have called it out when you're looking at the uh, video, but um, I wonder if we can do this without really screwing it up. Um, you see right here, 8C09, the location right above where ESP is pointing to, 8C09. And we've got this here, which happens to be 8C09. 
Why is it backwards? Because we know that it's 396F4338, but that buffer had it backwards. Why is it backwards? Some of you were talking about it in uh, the Discord. We're on a little endian system. So if we were big endian smalls hacking on a mainframe, we would have big endian system and things would be in the order that we expect them to. We would get pushed onto the stack in the right byte order. So we would literally just push 396F4338 onto the stack. We're on a little endian system. So we have to push our data in backwards, which is then 3843-6F39. That's what got pushed onto the stack. I know this is going kind of fast. You'll have a chance to review all of this later on your own. And I, I assure you, it'll make a lot more sense as you start going through it. So we wrote down 396F4338. We fed it to pattern creates complement, which is pattern offset. Um, and it tells us that the exact match is at offset 2006. So what that means is it takes exactly 2006 bytes of input before we overwrite the first byte of the return address. So we're going to validate that. We're going to do it by sending 2006 A's, then we're going to send four B's, and then we're going to send 50 C's. And if we are correct about our offset, EIP will be 42, 42, 42, 42, which is B, a capital B. So got another Python script here that does exactly that. We've got our buffer. We're going to fill it full of T run space period with 2006 A's, four B's, and 50 C's. So let's see what happens when we run this. Any second now, all right, we ran it. We see that immunity is paused. Access violation when executing 42, 42, 42, 42. So this is great. We know that we can control what goes in to the return address. We know that that gets loaded into EIP. So we can control essentially what's getting loaded in to tell the computer where the next instruction lives. Um, so if we look here, we can see we've got EIP uh, or the return address is where those Bs are. And then ESP is pointing to a location with Cs. So ESP is pointing to a location that starts immediately after where our return address was in our Python code. So if we could have uh, a way of telling the computer, go to the location where uh, ESP is pointing to. We could execute code that was at ESP. It's kind of like a jump to conclusion, Matt. I wish I had something like that, but I don't. But what I do have is a way of finding out how to tell the computer to go there. And that, in fact, is a jump ESP command. Jump ESP tells the processor, go to the location where uh, ESP is pointing to to find your next command. But we can't just put jump ESP in our code because if you remember the return address or rather EIP stores a memory location where uh, code lives or where our instruction lives. It does not contain actual instructions. It contains memory locations. And we can't write directly EIP, but we can overwrite the return address, which will get loaded into EIP. So we need to find a way we need to find a memory location that contains a jump ESP. Because if we could put that in for our return address, then the next instruction that would happen would be EIP would get loaded with that address. And then the computer would go, oh, I need to go to this memory location, which happens to be a jump ESP, which will tell it jump to the, the jump to ESP, jump to the stack that's filled with those C's that we just did in that last script. Enter another Metasploit utility, NASM shell. NASM shell will allow you to get the opcodes for any assembly language instruction. In this case, jump ESP is an FFE4. All right, Red Siege staff, don't forget, it's time for our weekly meeting for question of the week. We'll deal with that later. So jump ESP is FFE4. 
So what do we do with FFE4? Can we put FFE4 into, uh, into the location where our return address is? Yes, we can. We can put FFE4 into that location. However, that is now going to be looking at memory location FFE4, not looking at um, an instruction or memory location that contains FFE4 because we can't put instructions into the return address. We can only put memory addresses into the return address. So we need to find a return address. Some of you were talking about Mona earlier. We're gonna look at Mona now. Mona is uh, a Python script written by uh, Peter uh, Van Eckhout, I think his name is, uh, Corland Coder. And Mona allows you to do a bunch of great things with searching in memory with immunity. So we're gonna take a look at that. Got another demo for you here. So we have Vuln Server loaded right now, and I'm gonna run bang Mona modules. And this lists a bunch of modules. Modules are code that is loaded with our program. Um, DLLs, for instance, there's a bunch of information here. You see ASLR, none of the modules that are loaded with this program are uh, uh, ASLR protected. I just showed you that some of them are OS DLLs and some are not. The two that are not are Vuln server related, right? So we've got Vuln server.exe itself and then ESSFunk.dll. And over here, we've got some memory addresses, the, the base address, the top, and the size. So there's some various pieces of information about here about this program that we can get from Moda. It tells us which modules are loaded, so various things, like if we need to speak on the network, we're going to need to have network-related DLLs. If we wanted to do graphics, we need to have graphics DLLs. And then Vuln Server happens to load its own ESSFunk.dll. Nothing here is protected by ASLR, so we don't have to worry about that today. So how do we find an FFE4? We know how to load Mona now, we know how to find modules. Well, first we need to find out where is a good place to look for an FFE4, to look for a jump ESP. We could use any of these OS DLLs, right? All of these are loaded. The problem with using an OS DLL is that memory addresses associated with instructions, uh, and remember this is buffer overflow 101, so there's none of these ASLR stuff happening, uh, are gonna happen at fixed locations. But those fixed locations are specific to the service pack that you have and sometimes the patch level. Uh, so for instance, if I find a jump ESP in my user32.dll and I'm running Windows XP service pack three English edition and uh, Ghost or Injection are running uh, Windows XP service pack three French, the return address, the location of an, of an FFE4, a jump ESP, may be in a different location on their computer than my computer. Now that's not a problem, it just means that now I need to figure out which target I'm looking at so that I can find the right location on their computer versus mine. So if you've ever used Metasploit and it needs you need to specify your target sometimes, like which computer uh, or which operating system you're targeting, the reason you have to do that is so that it knows which return address to supply with the payload. But we have one here that's bundled with the program. ESSFunk.dll is part of Vuln Server. So it's gonna be loaded with Vuln Server every time. And as long as we're looking at Vuln Server 1.0 on any computer, it should be the exact same location for all of us. Where all of us could be running this on different versions of Windows and these addresses would be different the address of an FFE4, a jump ESP, and ESSFunk.dll should be the same, provided there is no ASLR in place. So let's find that. We're going to use another Mona module, another Mona command. This one is Mona find. So we're gonna run Mona find, we're gonna search for uh, an FFE4, and we're gonna search for it within ESSFunk.dll. And when we run that, it gives us a bunch of information. It tells us here's these various memory locations and that all contain a jump ESP. Some of them are page execute read, 
Uh, some of them are actually, they're all page execute reads, so we should be able to execute from any of these locations. Um, none of them are ASLR. We've got a bunch of different addresses here. Any of these should work. So what we can do is grab any one of these. I'm going to use the first one, 6250 11AF, but you should be able to use any of these return addresses within the uh, exploit, and it should work. So let's take a look at that, see if it actually does. We're going to put together a payload here. And there's a lot more that goes into this, like bad characters and stuff, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit. <clears throat> so we've got our our buffer here, T run space period. Um, I generated some shell code that would pop calc. That's not actually what I'm going to do, but that's uh, what it shows here. The uh, shell code for popping calc. Now, if I can pause this right here, um, running MS, MSF Venom to to generate our shell code I'm on a Windows platform x86. I'm going to do a Windows exec, so I'm going to use command.exe calc.exe. Um, exit funk equals thread, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I'm going to encode my shell code and I'm gonna tell it to ignore bad characters. Here we've got carriage return, live feed, and the null terminator. Because remember, strings are null terminated and we know that we have to send a carriage return line feed to tell the server that we are no longer sending data. We're done and it can process our payload that we've sent it. There are other bad characters, and there's a way that you go about fuzzing for those that I'm not going into, but some of the links that I'm talking about uh, that I give you later on in the slides, we'll talk about that. But bad characters are things that will cause the program to break. In our case, if we were to send a null terminator somewhere in our in our payload, the computer on the remote end running Vuln server would look at it and go, oh, hey, it's the end of the input. And everything past that that we sent would get dropped. So we don't want to send that. We also don't want to send a carriage return line feed because we know that that has a special meaning to the server. There may be other characters that you have to deal with. These are all we're going to have to deal with here. So I'm going to generate some Python formatted shellcode, which I've done here. I'm going to add that. And remember, I set our return address. We're going to use 6250.11af. However, we are on a little endian system, so we have to push that in a reverse byte order. So we give it AF 1150.62 right here. What we're going to send to the server then is a bunch of, we're going to send T run space period. We're going to send A's, a bunch of them, 2006 of them, but it doesn't matter what we send. I'm going to put in our return address, then a few hex 90s, which are NOPs or no ops. We're going to send eight of them, and then we're going to send our shell code. Now, I ran that, I sent it, and this popped up. <clears throat> That's the, the payload that I chose. And the reason that I chose this, because honestly, this is kind of how I felt the first time that I actually went through this process on my own without getting help from someone else, without Googling what I needed to do. I took the things that I had learned and went through and actually fuzzed the program, figured out all these things and created an exploit for it and it worked and that's how I felt. Um, so <clears throat> that's why I chose that instead of popping calc. Um, did want to point out one thing uh, we see here that Vuln server is still running. Vuln server is still running. Every other time it broke before. So Vuln server is still running. That's an important thing to note. Um, and I told you that I put in uh, these, I put eight of these 90s, these no ops, uh, hex 90s, and then my shell code. So um, another important thing to note here. Oh, hey, th thanks, Flash Player. No, I don't want to update in the middle of this thing. Um, we are still running. Vuln server, we ran it, we ran our exploit. Vuln server is still running. So let's run it again. And see what happens. And hey, it worked. It's still running. Let's run it again. And it's still running. We can see it's still running over here. Why is it still running? Well, the reason it's still running is when we generated our shell code with MSF Venom, one of the things that I gave it was uh, the, the command exit funk equals thread. 
there's thread in process. And thread means spin up a new thread so that we can uh, spin up a new thread so that we can execute our payload in that thread and return execution back to the program. Because if we don't, the program crashes. Now, in the end, we still would have executed our payload. However, we may not want to be crashing services uh, because that is a giveaway that we're there. So maybe we want to keep things up. Exit funk equals thread helps us with that. Now, the reason that the 90s were there is uh, we need to provide some space for Shikataga and I, our encoder, which helped us avoid those bad characters. It's actually its own little stub of encoded data plus a stub that decodes that data. If we don't provide some space on the stack for Shikataga and I to work or another encoder, what we ended up doing is what we end up doing is actually decoding our payload over the top of our payload. We would clobber it and it wouldn't work. So we put these 90s in there. How did I come up with eight knops? That's the first example that I found uh, used eight. And so I've been using eight since then. You could probably do four, you could use more. I don't think it would make a difference. Talked about using exit funk equals thread to allow it to continue executing. So I know this is a lot, Go back through, um, you'll be able to watch this video again and hear me uh, explain this. If you want some other ways of hearing me explaining it, um, that maybe I explained it clear another time. I also gave the stock at DerbyCon uh, a couple of years ago. I gave it at B-Sides Winnipeg a couple of years ago, so it was recorded there as well. Um, so <clears throat> you can find a couple of different versions of it that explains going through this whole thing. I will give you links to the Python code that I use so you can walk right through this and then reproduce this if you have uh, everything working correctly. It should work. If your system's running right, it'll work for you out of the box. Uh, but that's great. Okay, you figured out Vault Server. Now what? It doesn't give you much. Well, there's other programs out there. Exploit Database is a great resource. Um, back during a specific period of time, uh, there was a lot of uh, buffer overflows in these stack-based buffer overflows. So think before Windows XP uh, started implementing ASLR is when the more when you started having more protections. But there's a lot of programs out there like this MiniShare 1.4.1 has a remote buffer overflow that works almost exactly like this program in Vuln Server. Almost exactly the same. You could fuzz it almost exactly the same way. You just need to change the command, the socket that you're connecting to. There's a little bit more to it, but not much. The reason I call this out is you can download this vulnerable version of uh, Minishare, and then you could run it on your test machine, and you could fuzz it. And there are other programs out there. This, this is just one of them. Search for buffer overflow on exploit database. 32-bit uh, FTP, another one to test. Yep, there are, there's a bunch of them. There's a ton of MP3 players that came out back around this same time, the early 2000s, that had uh, vulnerabilities with M3U pay, uh, playlists. So that time, that one you're not generating, um, you're not generating a payload that connects to a socket, you're generating a file that gets read in. So it's a little bit different and it might be an interesting challenge just to learn how to do that. Um, but uh, there are lots of them out there that you can practice with. I do want to give some credits to where it's due. Uh, of course, Stephen Bradshaw for writing Bone Server. Uh, I mentioned Coreland Coder for the Mona modules. Um, Ron Bowes, and actually, I don't think I, I don't know if I linked to where Mona is. If I don't link it, um, Jaycon, just remind me, and we'll get that added to the deck. Uh, Ron Bowes. Um, Ron Bowes is uh, a wizard and an incredibly fun and generous Canadian um, from Winnipeg, just north of here now, living out west in the U.S. here, and uh, his skullsecurity.org um, website is full of useful information that you should check out. I also want to thank uh, a couple of friends. They These guys all helped me out. Uh, when I was first learning buff buffer overflows, and they really walked me through the process and made things uh, made things clear to me. So thank you to them. Um, oh, I did have Mona in here. So this is where you can download Vuln Server um, from thegraycorner.com, and Mona can be downloaded from Corland's GitHub. 
Um, I also link to some learning resources. So this is Stephen Bradshaw's own blog here, this first one, um, beginning stack-based buffer overflow using Bone Server. Um, Peter also has one on his, on the Coreland blog and a whole series on buffer overflows on the Coreland blog. Um, Security Sift's got another one, um, all get you going. Some more reference material, um, Wikipedia has some stuff on how a stack buffer overflow works and uh, just x86 in general with the stack. And of course, uh, Skull Security has an extensive selection of information on x86, the stack buffer overflows. Um, all their places to learn. Uh, the overthewire.org uh, wargaming network has a bunch of different war games you can play, not just for buffer overflows, but some of them are buffer overflows specific, where you can practice on various complexity, increasing complexity buffer overflows. Uh, Vulnhub has a bunch of VMs that you can download that have uh, buffer overflows in them. There are some in Hack the Box, um, plus Hack the, Hack the Box, another just great place to go learn and practice uh, um, various security exploits. Um, there's me. I wish Jaycon wanted to cut out the fish here. This, this is part of a big fish. It was fun. It was a lot of, a lot of fun to catch, so you just get me without the fish. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me directly, Mike at RedSiege.com. I'm Hardwater Hacker on Twitter. You can interact with Red Siege. Uh, on Twitter at Red Siege. Um, there are blog articles that are available at redsiege.com slash blog. These slides are available at redsiege.com slash buffer overflow 101. And if you go to my GitHub, github.com slash hardwater hacker slash EIP, we'll have the, uh, these, um, it's got an old copy of these slides there as well. It has uh, the various Python scripts that I use today, plus a couple others that we didn't go through just because of time. Um, but that is Buffer Overflow 101 in a nutshell. <clears throat> it gets much more advanced beyond this, right? The next thing after you do this, and you do this a few times, and you start looking at things like SCH overwrites, and you start looking at egg hunter exploits, and then you start figuring about memory protections, DEP and ASLR. And then eventually we get into things like ROP gadgets. And I'm going to be honest with you, I am not a uh, I am not a wizard at buffer overflows. Writing uh, things like ROP gadgets makes my mind hurt. Someone on Twitter uh, yesterday was like, "Buffer overflow makes their mind hurt." And I was like, "Me too, man. Me too." Like it makes my mind hurt sometimes, even when I'm trying to explain this talk. So. Uh, there's a lot to learn. But the point is that I wanted you to, to learn that it's something that's accessible. It's giving you a starting point to help you understand. And if you go no further than this, you now know at a most basic how a buffer overflow works, um, which will allow you to better understand when you're reading about a threat in your, in your job, maybe you got to figure out, you know, what's the impact, what's the severity, how do we protect against this? This gives you a better idea of how it works. Um, walk through these resources that I gave you and uh, you are well on your way. Reach out to us on various social medias. Uh, contact us if you, uh, uh, you know, want, want us to talk on something specific uh, in the Discord here, see if we can't do some other talks. I know someone met some, uh, talked about some 64-bit buffer overflows. Uh, that's something that maybe we could get up in another one. Um, they, aren't, they aren't functionally different. Um, they're, they're not different. And I, one thing I mentioned or didn't mention is that, uh, for instance, uh, ARM. ARM is not incredibly different from what we did here. It's just different instructions, a little bit different the way the memory is laid out, but uh, Azaria's got some great resources on buffer overflows for ARM, and you could take what you learned here and apply it there. Um, what's my secret to losing weight? Um, I drink a lot of water and I eat less. Um, and this summer, if you've been following my Twitter, I do a heck of a lot of walking and uh, uh, hiking, so, all right. Thanks, everyone. Right, see you guys.